Hey guys, so we're going to be doing some bits today on proof. Um, I'm going to do some recap. So some of these things that we have here are going to be a, re a recap from some stuff of some like year 12 kind of proof. And then this is going to be the new stuff that we've got here, which is going to be our year 13 kind of stuff, which is our proof by contradiction. So the year 12 stuff, I'm going to be giving you just some stuff that's in this exercise. If you want, you can look at the year 12 textbook as well. Um, and then for year 13, I'm going to be asking you to kind of listen through some of these problems and then have a go from exercise. I think it's the first exercise in the Pure Year 2 book. So we're sort of finishing off with one of the first things we really should have done. So there's these four different kinds of proof that we need. There's direct proof, which is sometimes called proof by deduction because you deduce the proof. There's proof by exhaustion, which is about exhausting all of the possible options of things that you can do to show that that's, that's pro proven something. Um, and you can also disprove something. You can do a disproof by using a counterexample. So if you want to say that something's not true, all you really need to do is find one time when it's not true and it will prove that it's not true all the time. And then proof by contradiction is the one that people tend to find a little bit trickier, but once you wrap your head around it, I think you'll be fine with it. So I'll do these in two separate videos. So here, we're going to have a look, I'm going through this list, we're going to start off with direct proof. Now I think you probably know how to do direct proof already, so I think I might just dive in with this one. It says prove that every odd integer is the difference of two perfect squares. Well, all we need to think about is some of this language that we've got here. So an odd integer, that is going to be something like, I don't know, 2n plus 1. I'm sure you've come across this because this would be even and this would make it odd. Difference, we know is going to be to do with subtract. And two perfect squares just means things that can be written as something that has been squared. Now, I put this one in here because it's kind of a sneaky one. Um, and we're going to try and prove that every odd, odd integer is the difference of two perfect squares. Now, you probably wouldn't see how I would do this trick, but this is quite a, a good proof to know. So we have that 2n plus 1. Well, this is going to sound really, really weird, but actually I could write that this is the same as n squared plus 2n plus 1. This is my odd integer that I've got here. I could say it's the same as 2n, uh, n squared plus 2n plus 1 minus n squared. So what I've really done is I have taken this little extra n squared here and I've taken away an n squared. So I've added one in and I've taken it away. So I haven't actually changed anything about this one. Now, all you should recognize is that n squared plus 2n plus 1 can actually just be written as n plus 1 squared minus n squared. So this factorizes to this and this is exactly the same that we have here. So we've actually kind of proven it. We've now said that an odd integer can be expressed as the difference of two perfect squares. So we can say, so a conclusion statement, every odd integer can be expressed as the difference of two perfect squares. Now, I don't think in the exam they would ask you to be able to come up with this weird idea of putting an n squared on here and an n squared being subtracted. I think they would probably lead you through that idea of trying to build up to this and then you doing that last step to kind of make that jump between these things that you've got here. That's how I think they would do it. Now, it's actually even more powerful than just the difference of two perfect squares. These two perfect squares that we've actually got here are consecutive perfect squares because you have n squared and you have n plus 1 squared. So actually I'm going to just add that in further. The perfect squares, it's a shame I can't spell, the perfect squares are consecutive. Consecutive means uh, coming next to each other, consecutive. So consecutive means next to each other. Next to each other in order. Okay, so that's the idea of a direct proof. And this one, I think, as I just said, they would lead you through this one. But we came up with this language of an odd integer. So I just wanted to quickly talk to you about some of these already. So if you ever get asked to talk about an odd number, you would say that an odd number is 2n plus 1, where n is an integer. So I guess I really should have said at the beginning here, let n be an integer. So it's clear that I'm actually talking about this as an odd integer rather than anything. n could have been, I don't know, minus 3, or uh, not minus 3, n could have been a minus 0 0.3, or it could have been a fraction. So we need to be clear that we're actually talking about n as an integer. 
If you wanted to talk about a different odd number, you couldn't also call it 2n plus 1, you'd have to call it 2m plus 1. We tend to use the letters n and m here. If you were looking for consecutive odd numbers, you could do 2n minus 1, 2n plus 1, because if you think um, you're going one below an even number and one above an even number, that means that they would be odd numbers that are kind of next door neighbours. Same thing to even, you can do 2n, for a different one you can do 2m, then consecutive even numbers you can just start with 2n and then adding on 2, so you can do 2n plus 2, 2n plus 4, or 2n minus 2, 2n, 2n plus 2. If it says that A is a factor of B, well, that means that these two things here, when you multiply them together, you get B. So both A and N are factors of B here. So A is a factor of B, you could write in this kind of way, where N is an integer. And then last of all, we have a rational number. I'll talk to you a little bit more about rational numbers later on. But a rational number is basically something that can be written as a fraction. So I'm going to write it as a over b. And this is where a and b are integers and have a highest common factor of 1, i.e. it is a fraction in its lowest terms. It cannot be cancelled down any further. This is all of the language that I think that you need to be able to do these kinds of proof questions that I've come across in any exams. So let's just have a go at doing some more of these. Prove that the difference between the squares of any two consecutive integers is equal to the sum of these two integers. So, first of all, let n be any integer. Two consecutive integers are, therefore, n, and the next one would be n plus 1. And it says, prove that the difference between the squares of any two consecutive integers is equal to the sum of these two integers. So we're now going to get that our n plus 1 squared minus n squared, let's actually work out what this is. So that would be n squared plus 2n plus 1 minus n squared, which is 2n plus 1, which is equal to n plus n plus 1 which is the sum of these two integers. So the difference of these two, uh, sorry, the difference between the squares of any of these consecutive integers is equal to the sum of these two integers. So uh, this result proves the given statement. I'm not gonna write the whole thing out. I think you know how to do these. These kind of pop up a lot in GCSE as well, this kind of style. I'm going to have a look now at doing a proof by exhaustion. Now, exhaustion means try out slash exhaust all the possibilities. Now, it says prove that no square number ends in an 8. So we're not going to prove every single square number, even though that's what it sounds like. Really. We're not going to exhaust all the possibilities. But we're going to try and do a few and see if we can then use some reasoning to show why none of them would ever end in an 8. So we know that 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, 5 squared is 25, 6 squared is 36, 7 squared is... oh my gosh... 49, 8 squared is 64, 9 squared is 81, and 10 squared is 100. Now if you look here, none of these ever end in an 8. And then if you think about doing bigger numbers, I don't know, let's just say something like, what should we do, 124 squared, well because it ends in a 4, it's also going to end in a 6. 124 squared is 1, 5, 3, 7, 6. So because this one ended in a 4, when you square it, it will end in a 6, just like this one did. So that's kind of the, the, the logic that's going on behind this. So what we're going to say here, to prove that no square number ends in 8, we just need some sentence to try and show this. Um, if a number ends in a 1 or a 9, its square ends in 
a1. Similarly, if it ends in a, what have we got next, in a 2 or an 8, its square ends in a 4. If ending in a 3 or a 7, its square ends in a 9. If ending in a 4 or a 6, its square ends in a 6. If ending in a 5, its square ends in a 5. If ending in a 0, its square ends in a 0. Have we done all of them? So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Hence, no square number will end in an 8. They will only end There we go, it's doing exactly what I thought it was going to do, making a mess. It will only end in a 1, 4, 5, 6, 9, or 0. Is that right? 1, 4, 9, 6, 5, 0. One, yeah, great. So it will only end in a 1. So this is a proof by exhaustion. We've looked at all the possible things that a square number could end in. None of them were an 8, so we've exhausted all the options, shows that it's, um, we've proven it, okay? Other types where they might ask you to do this proof by exhaustion, they might say, prove that for n being less than 10, that blah 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 is an even number, and you can literally just substitute in n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, all the way up to 10, and just show that it was whatever it was trying to show you. That was if it was n is less than 10, but I should have said n is positive as well there. So proof by exhaustion is kind of boring, which is why I decided to pick out an example that was a bit a bit trickier, it looked a bit like this. So one more thing before I take a pause, we are going to do a disproof using a counter example. So we're trying to prove that things are false. It is suggested that for every prime number p, 2p plus 1 is also prime. Prove that this is false. So all we need, we need just one example that doesn't work. That's all we need to show that this doesn't work. So I need to find a prime number that when I double it and add one, I get something that is not a prime number. So if we just try a couple of them out, well, if p is equal to two, then two p plus one is equal to five, but that's prime, so that one's not gonna be good for us. If p is equal to three, two p plus one is equal to seven, but that's prime. Okay, so you can see why someone came up with this statement. If p is 5, 2p plus 1 is 11, but that's prime. If p is 7, 2p plus 1 is 15. Aha! But 15 is not prime. So, but 15 is not prime. So, the statement is false. So you can see what happened here. We were trying to, this is what the person thought. They thought that if you take a prime number and double it and add one, you get another prime number. We want to say that it's false. So all we need to do is find a prime number that when you double it and add one, you don't get a prime number. So this is our counter example that we have here. And we just do this little conclusion to say that the statement is false by basically explaining what we're thinking, okay? So we're going to pause there and then I'm going to do proof by contradiction.